What's up, everybody? What's up? Welcome back to Discovering Nicole. That would be me, your girl, Nicole. So today we're going to talk about how can your life become unmanageable and you be sober at the same time? Well, don't you know, if there was a way to find out, I would fucking find out. And so I'm here to share with you guys how my life became unmanageable and I was fucking sober, stone cold fucking sober. So come on in, get, take a seat. Don't be afraid. Let me know what you're struggling with. Comment your, uh, comment where you're from and how long you've been sober. If you're not sober, that's okay too. You're always welcome to hang out with us. It doesn't matter. Uh, I don't really, I don't care if you're sober or not. I just want you guys to know that I'm a regular person just like you. I'm not like you know, famous or a celebrity or nothing like that. I'm a regular girl who's trying to stay sober, who was a straight out fucking knock down, drag out junkie. Okay. I used to fight my husband for the first shot of meth. Okay. Um, I was miserable in my life for a really long time. Drugs worked for a really long time and they helped me to not be miserable. But then all of a sudden they started ruining my life <laughs> and they turned on me. And um, I decided to get sober after my son got taken away from me. But after I got sober, I, you know, when I had, mm, when I gave birth to my son, um, when I was pregnant, I didn't really gain weight until about seven months pregnant. And I went from about 150, 160 to 200 pounds. And when I gave birth to my son, I was like 205 or 201 or something like that. And I gave birth to my son. And when I got home from the hospital, I was back down to like 187. Okay. And then I lost the weight and went back down to like 160, 165. And I was happy. I was happy at that weight. Well, I started getting high again. I, you know, had my son taken away and I had dropped down to like 150, 140. Well, I went into treatment. I fought to get my son back. I fought hard. Hey, girl, congratulations on eight years. Hey, Libby. Hey, Bianca. And I got my son back. And um, when I got my son back, you guys, my main focus uh, before I got him back was getting him back. And then my main focus after getting him back was fucking maintaining sobriety. Okay? Because I had a past. Okay? I had never been able to stay sober before. I always relapsed. Okay? Always. Always. And I knew this about myself, okay? So I knew that I had to fucking be real fucking serious and stay on top of myself. So that's what I did. I became obsessed with staying sober, okay? That's why I started my YouTube channel. That's why I started uh, making videos because I needed support from other people that were in recovery. That were in recovery like me, doing maintenance medication. And I wanted to find other like-minded people. Well... 2006, 17, no, 2015 is when I got sober. So 2015 went by, 2016 went by, and 2017, and I was gaining the normal amount of sober weight, right? I hadn't went over the deep end. I was still like a regular size. I wasn't unhealthy. I looked great, right? I looked great. Well, then the motherfucking panini hit, the pandemic hit. Okay, and they locked us down and we had to stay at home and we had to, I had to homeschool my son. Right. Well, that was fucking depressing just in itself, having to be a homeschooler. Like, what the fuck? You know, what I mean, I didn't sign up for that shit. And so I'm, I could not do it. I, it was I was miserable. I love my son, but I, I no, no. OK. And so I was already struggling with depression. I had already went to the doctor and got put on uh, Lexapro and Wellbutrin, which Lexapro can make you gain weight, okay? And um, I was struggling bad. I was struggling. I was depressed. I wanted to get out of my mother-in-law's house. We had been renting that house from her. I'm cleaning my brushes while I'm talking to y'all. Uh, we had been renting that house from her for seven and a half years, and I was fucking done. You know, I was, I was really fucking depressed. Well, when the panini hit, I just, I just fucking blew up, dude. I started binge eating at night. Okay. Now I have been diagnosed with binge eating disorder and I've also been diagnosed with, um, with, um, an eating disorder period, um, starving myself. I never, I never made myself throw up. I never binged and purged, but I would. I would restrict food when I was younger. So I've been 
through the ringer with, uh, with eating disorders, okay? And I've been formally diagnosed by a doctor. Well, for some reason, my eating disorder flipped, and instead of restricting myself, I started to binge at night. And I would binge to the point where I would get sick from it, okay? I would binge so much at one time that I was physically ill and I would wake up in the morning and my stomach would burn. Okay. It would burn. Oh, it was awful. And when I would try to go to the bathroom in the morning, taking a dump in the morning, because I have a shit every morning, no matter what. Okay. Taking a dump in the morning was just like horrible, but my stomach, man, it was just like hurting so much, right? Because I was just eating and eating and eating at night. And I knew I shouldn't be eating at night, but it wasn't registering like how unhealthy this is for me, right? What a, how what I'm doing is unhealthy. I was just doing it because it was making me feel better. It was helping me to not feel dep depressed is what I thought. Because as I was binging, I was getting those dopamine hits, right? Those hits of dopamine, um, that good feeling in your brain. And, and it, that was like I was willing to... I, I don't think I was really realizing that I was doing it, but I was trading, I was sacrificing so I could feel that good feeling, you know? And by the next thing I knew, it was 2021, okay? And, um, or, yeah, it was 2021, and I was traveling to see Dr. B for the first time in California, okay? And I remember being so fucking hot and sweaty in the airport and on the airplane, it was the middle of fucking July, and the airplane that I rode in, the second one, the air condition was out. So we had to sit by each other, sweating our balls off, okay? I was in the middle, sweating. And when I got to California, I remember being so self-conscious about my weight because I was going to meet Dr. B and everybody that I work with up there in California. And I was so self-conscious because when you go to California, everybody's beautiful in California, it feels like. Everybody, you know? And when I got up there and I went on that trip, I realized, damn, man, like, I'm really fucking heavy. Well, in 2020 in March, let's back up just a little bit. Um, one of my friends was going on to a talk show, okay? The Tamron Hall Show. And Tamron Hall was having people on to talk about cross addiction during the pandemic. Addiction and cross addiction during the pandemic. And we were supposed to go on there and share how we were cross addicted. Well, I didn't really realize I was cross addicted yet, but one of my friends already knew I was and reached out to me from uh, my YouTube channel and said, Hey, Nicole, I'm going on this channel to talk about cross addiction to social media. And I really think that you would be great to go with me and talk about cross addiction to food. And I was like, oh, it kind of burned a little, you know, when he said that. But he was right. I, I, I was cross addicted. And I had kind of talked about it a little bit, but I hadn't said it out loud and admitted it yet, you know. And so I was like, sure, I'll go. Well, during the process of getting ready to go on to this talk show, they have you talk to the manager and they... Um, have you send in videos and stuff. So part of me getting on the show was sending video of myself when I binged at night. And like documenting my, the food that I was eating. So I like really had to look at myself when I was sitting there and eating like two huge platefuls of Chinese food six egg rolls, four of those um, wontons with the cream cheese inside of them, just like copious amounts of food, just like an empty, like a fucking bottomless pit, you know, and I had to send these videos in for them to watch. Of course, during the videos, I got emotional like I am now, and they called me back, and they were like, these are, gr thank you so much, this is great, like, we really appreciate you being so vulnerable and all this stuff, and I was hoping, like, I'm going to go on this talk show and they're going to help us. They're going to like put us with a weight loss doctor or something like that. Right. Um, but that they didn't do shit. Like we literally went on there and told our story and that was it. But anyway, so to the whole wide world is when I finally admitted that I had cross addiction. I admitted it for the first time on national TV to the whole world where they could see me in my fucking gluttony of fucking binge eating. Okay. 
and me crying on fucking national TV because I don't want to die. And, and I want to be able to do things with my son and not feel like dog shit while I'm doing them. Right? And so that's when I like really became aware of how bad it was and that I needed to get help. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start working out. I'm going to start eating healthy and I'm going to get on the right path. So I reached out to my friend Nick and he's like super in shape and I asked him if he would be my personal trainer and he was like, sure. And so Nick started personally training me and work, working out with me. He started working me out. We would go live on YouTube together and we would do workout routines. And I was kicking ass and taking names on my workouts, y'all. I was doing fucking burpees, squats, fucking all kinds of shit. Like hardcore cardio, just really kicking ass, right? But I, but I wasn't addressing my eating. I wasn't addressing my binging, like my obsession with eating all this food. And I was just working out, right? So I wasn't seeing any really, um, the only thing I was seeing happening was I was getting muscular. Like my legs were starting to get solid again because I had, they had gotten a little jiggly and things like that. But I wasn't seeing any results. And see, one thing that happens to me is mm, I will start yeah, something visitor. when it comes to weight. And if I don't see results right away, like I'll give up. I'll give up. Or if I see results like, you know, within the first week, and then maybe I fuck up and binge the next morning. Instead of saying, I only binged one time out of this whole 30 days, um, you know, let's keep it moving, let's keep on track, I will give up. I, I would binge, and I would relapse, and instead of getting right back on track, I would say, fuck it, and I would give up. So that's what, would ha that's what started to happen. It was every, I would start, and I would be doing good, and then I would relapse and say, fuck it, right? Well, then Nick talked me into joining. Do y'all know that place where you go in and it's like a gym atmosphere, but it has no air condition inside of it. And it's like super duper hardcore. Like you lift weights, you fucking do rowing. It's hardcore. He talked me into doing that, right? I paid $250 to sign up for these fucking, fucking classes in on Little Rock. And motherfuckers, I did them for one month. And I thought I was going to die. Okay? Die. It was fucking summertime. It was hot as fuck. Had no air condition in there. It was CrossFit. CrossFit. Okay? So I want you to imagine. A bitch is 235. And she's up there in the CrossFit. Like she's fucking, you know, in shape and shit. Oh my God. It was just too much for me. I was a beginner. Hey, Annette. Come on in hang out. I was a, a beginner and I needed to take it slowly, right? And so I did it. I followed through for the month and I did it. And then I was out of there like a thief in the night. Fuck y'all. You know, I couldn't do it. So 2020, 2021, all through 2021, I'm on uh, YouTube. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Facebook. And um, around the very beginning of 2021, the end of 2020, I started to get cyber bullied and cyber stalked by a woman here on Facebook called Carol Twilliger. She's dead now. She died like a week or two ago. And this woman started to endlessly cyber bully me, talking about my weight, talking about my teeth, talking about how I parent my child, everything she could think of. Okay. Thank you, CJ. And um, it was awful. And so I started to become suicidal. The winter of 2021, I wanted to kill myself. And people were jumping on the bandwagon and doing it too. I mean, it went on for over a year. These people did this to me. Just straight up cyber stalked and cyber bullied me about everything. My weight, my teeth, calling me a body broker, saying that, you know, I'm taking advantage of addicts when I'm not even a fucking body broker and I don't even work for a rehab, which was like the craziest shit I've ever had happen to me. So I started to get super duper discouraged and I started to get really obsessed again with my weight and feeling really ugly and feeling really just uncomfortable all the time, all the time. I felt so uncomfortable all the time. I couldn't wear any of my clothes. Okay. I couldn't wear any of my jeans. Anytime I would order a t-shirt online, I would try to get it extra large and then it would come in and it would be too tight. And I'm like, fuck that, dude. I'm not going up to a 2X, 3X. Fuck that, you know? And I was just miserable, miserable. 
So I started trying different things, okay? I saw this girl on TikTok named Trashley, and she was doing this medicine called True V Boost, okay? Which is like a supplement that you get across the counter. And it worked at the beginning. It worked. It helped me with my appetite, but, um, but it stopped working after a while because my body got used to it. And so, you know, I maybe lost like five pounds, and then I didn't see results, and I gave up. Gave up again. And I just kept giving up. I think the, like, really big wake-up call was when, you know, I didn't feel comfortable getting naked to have sex with my husband. You know? Um, I felt so ugly. I didn't want him to see me like that. I didn't want to be naked in front of my husband, man. What the fuck? You know? And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fucking expeditionist in the bedroom. Like, I like to get freaky and have fun. But I couldn't even take my clothes off in front of my husband to take a shower. Okay? That's how fucking insecure I was. And, you know, I, what made me even more insecure was all this hate that I was getting online. And all the people that were making fun of me for being fat. And calling me fat. And saying I'm a fat ass. Um, you know, like... Just horrible comments, okay? Horrible comments. And then when I joined Facebook Reels, it, it got even, even that was bad. And so I was just like so insecure and I felt so much like shit, right? And so I knew that I had to make a change and I knew that I had become cross addicted and my whole life was unmanageable because of food. I was fucking sober as a judge, but my life sucked because of fucking food, dude. And I, and I didn't know what to do. So... I started thinking back to when I was younger. When I was younger and I got out of prison, I was 210 pounds when I got out of the penitentiary. Okay? And I, when I got out of the pen, I said, you know what? I am not going to let this weight define me. I am going to get myself back together and get myself in shape. And so I started walking. and Walking every day. I would wake up in the morning. I would have one thing of oatmeal. Okay, I would go to work from 6 to 2. At lunch, I would have a turkey sandwich, always drinking water, okay? And then I would come home, get, uh, get dressed, go walk for about two hours, okay? And um, then come home, I would have some baked chicken, some broccoli, salt and pepper, okay? Maybe some potatoes, lots of water. For dinner, and then if I wanted to have a little snack at night, I um, would have some yogurt, some Yoplait or whatever, and then I would go to bed, and I would not eat at night in the middle of the night, okay? I would literally put a chain on my fucking refrigerator to keep myself from opening the refrigerator at night, okay? So, and I lost 65 pounds doing that. 65 pounds, but this was when I was younger, and I hadn't had kid, a kid yet, but I knew that I had the discipline to do it, right? I knew if I could do it back then, that I could do it now, so I was like, okay, when I'm ready, I'll start doing it, right? So, 2021 passed, and then we came into 2022 in January, and in January of 2022, I was like, you know what? I am going to jump off Suboxone. I'm going to jump off Suboxone. It's Suboxone's fault that I'm fat. Meh. Right? And so, I had all of these Okay, so 2022 came, and I decided I hate Suboxone. I'm getting off Suboxone, right? Um, which was a stupid decision because I wasn't ready. And so, I had gotten all the way down in my paper to 0.25, but I hadn't been at 0.25 for very long. And so, I jumped. I jumped and I managed to get off and I was off for about two weeks, okay? I was off for about two weeks and I had just the worst debilitating depression and I just, I couldn't hack it, man. So I got back on my little 2.5 or 0.25, excuse me. And I was, you know, like, oh, well, I failed. Big deal. I'll try again later, right? And so that was in January. Well, January, February, March, I turned 40 years old. I turned 40 years old. I fucking ate like a glutton. I fucking, fucking binge ate. Fucking, just fucking horrible, right? And I was miserable. I was 40 years old and I was miserable. And I knew that if I didn't fucking get my weight in check, that I'm going to die like this, right? And so I went to the doctor. 
I reached out to my doctor and I was desperate. I went to my doctor crying, y'all, with my fucking tail between my legs, in complete defeat, right? Needing help. Needing help. All right? My doctor literally didn't do shit. He didn't help me. Okay? He fucking gave me Sixenda, which was a $1,200 shot that I couldn't afford. So I paid for the $1,200 shot one month. $1,200. And you know what? I lost 20 pounds in that one month, but you want to know why? Because I shit and I couldn't stop throwing up from the from the shot. It was horrible. Okay? And so I was miserable. Hey, you, you too, CJ? I was miserable. And so I could not hold up that, that, that shot. I couldn't follow through with it. And so I reached out to him again. I went to my doctor and I told him, you know, like, I've been researching medications that are for people that struggle with binge eating disorder. I've been sober for seven years, and I really think that Vyvanse or Adipex would be something that could really help me, and I am willing to take drug tests, come in for pill counts, go to therapy, whatever y'all need me to do. But I really need help to get off this weight, at least to get started, right? And when I tell you guys, he was like, well, uh, because you have a past history of addiction, you know, we're not going to do that. And I was like, so basically, if I was a regular person, you would, he even said, he said, normally I would prescribe you Adipex. But because you have a history of addiction, I'm not going to. But when I tell you guys, that pissed me off so bad. So fucking bad. Same thing with my ADHD, Okay. And all, I, I, need, I needed help. I don't want, I didn't want the medication because I was trying to get high or anything like that. That was the last thing on my mind, okay? I was miserable, okay? I was suicidal. And I needed somebody to help me, just give me a boost. Well, he wasn't going to help me, so I took matters into my own hands. And I helped my damn self. And when I tell you guys, it took me about, after that, I went into a deep depression I was crying every day. I was still dealing with Carol Terwilliger, uh, making videos about me and calling me fat and posting about me all day long. And it was just, I was miserable. Well, it was probably around June or July, I had had enough. I had enough. And I was like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this fucking weight off, right? And so I reached out to Ashley and I started, I got back on True V, which True V Boost has a medication in it that is a stimulant, okay? But it's not, it doesn't show, it can show up on a drug test, but it normally doesn't. And it's not like an amphetamine or, it's, it's just, I don't know how to explain it. It's a stimulant though. And I've read all about it. And so, but it's sold across the counter. So it can't be that bad, right? So I got back on the True V Boost. I started taking it every single day. And I started really focusing on not putting fucking food in my mouth every five seconds, okay? I started training myself to wake up in the morning, have something to eat for breakfast, something good and hearty, okay? Some eggs, some bacon, you know what I'm saying? Uh, something that I could eat and that was going to hold me on, um, hold me through the day, okay? Because here was the problem. Oh, Chrissy, hold on just a second. The problem was... I was only eating one time a day, and then I would binge at night, and so I had gotten my body used to starving. I would not eat all day long, and then by like two or three, I would eat dinner or eat a really big lunch and then have dinner later, and then I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would binge, right? Well, I started eating in the morning, having a light lunch, and then having a little bit of something um, before seven o'clock. Before 7 o'clock at night, I would, and I would not eat after 7 o'clock, okay? I would not eat after 7 o'clock. So, little by little, I remember the first, like, one or two weeks, I went from 235. I had gotten all the way up to 235. I went from 235 to um, 220, or, 220 or something. Then 215, then 210, and this is over like six months. What, what are we in? We're in November, okay? So this is July, August, September, October, November, all right? 
Like it didn't happen overnight. And then just probably about two and a half months ago, I hit 210, then 207, then 205, right? But I was stuck like around 2010, like 210, I would fluctuate back and forth. And I started to get really discouraged again, right? Really discouraged. And I stopped taking the True V, and I just kept doing what I was doing on the eating uh, tip. I haven't started working out. I haven't done anything like that. And I wasn't even walking on a regular basis, okay? Um, and I was like, fuck it, you know, ugh, whatever. So I started focusing on, you know, we have to move. We started packing our stuff up. Um, hold on, y'all. My phone's about to die. I started packing our stuff up. I started not focusing on my weight so much and just focusing on not overeating at night, not binging. And I would have binges. I would have slips where I would binge. But the difference now is if I have a slip and I binge, guess what? I don't throw away my whole fucking uh, six months worth of progress because I binged one night. If I binge one night, I say, okay, you binged. Why did you binge? Was it because you starved yourself all day and didn't eat? Was it because you're depressed and had a fight with your husband? Um, is it because you are been around a bunch of your trigger foods, foods that you just like, when, you, when you're around them, like you get fucking, you want to eat all of the shit? Like I have to, I, I would go down the line and I would check myself, right? And see why did I binge? Because there's a reason why you binge, okay? A lot of the reasons, the reason why I would binge would be because of stress, getting into it with my mother-in-law, being pissed about living where I was living because I was tired of living in that 8,000 square foot house that was way too big for our family and I could not keep up with it and I was hella depressed. Or I was fucking being fucking cyber, cyber stalked and cyber bullied by fucking Carol Twilliger and this other bitch named uh, That Therapist Tanya on TikTok calling CPS on me trying to send the law to my house. All kinds of bullshit. And those are the things that were triggering me and stressing me out and I would eat at night, overeat, right? It was 8,000 square feet is how big that house was. It was two stories. And um, so I was... I started to look at the reasons why I was binging to help myself to stop binging. Well, I was still stuck at that damn 210, right? Still stuck at that 210. Well, recently, my mother-in-law, um, she started construction on the house, which was no big deal. We were going to live upstairs, and they were supposed to just, like, take the carpet out downstairs and repaint the downstairs. Well, she failed to tell us that they were doing the whole house. And so, basically, we got pushed out of our house. We couldn't live there anymore because of the massive amount of construction that was being done on it. And we had no place to live. I hadn't even called a place or anything. And we had to go live with her for three fucking weeks. And I was pissed. I was livid. Okay? So for the last three weeks, I've been living up underneath my mother-in-law, who is driving me crazy. Um, driving me crazy. Okay? And it was I was miserable. All right. Well, she didn't have a scale there. So I came. I finally got here. I got my scale out last night and I stepped on it and it said 199. They did not cause you that kind of trouble. People are pathetic. What do you mean? Are you telling me I'm pathetic, Liz? You say they did not cause you that kind of trouble. Oh, yeah, they did. That therapist, Tanya, as well as Carol, those little cronies. They called Child Protective Services on me. I have all the proof in the receipts of them talking in a group chat about me and saying that they called Child Protective Services on me. And you want to know the reasoning? One day I was on a live stream and y'all know how when you have big boobs, if you don't have a bra on, they sweat underneath. Well, I was on a live stream and I said, oop, they're sweating, right? <clears throat> Oh, okay, I thought you were talking about me because I was like, I'm not lying. I have proof. And I wiped the towel underneath my bosom to get the sweat out, right? They called CPS on me for that and literally wrote in a group chat that I needed to have a safety plan knowing that my child had been taken away from me in the past. It's okay. I misunderstood what you wrote um, knowing that. Then 
after doing that, and they would post about me on Carol's page. And so all these other people would come and post underneath it who didn't even know me, who would talk about sending the state police to my house because my husband is a gun collector and keeps guns in a locked up safe to where I can't even get to them, right? I mean, all kinds of bullshit that I'm honest and transparent about online. And they would try to use my own fucking shit that I share with you guys to hurt me and harm me and my family. And so these women did this to me for almost two years. And I literally, I, I reported it to the police. Okay. I called a lawyer. I had a fucking consultation with a, a lawyer. Like it was bad, you guys. It was bad. And so... She was calling me, she was making fun of my weight a lot. And that was affecting me because then a lot of other people in the recovery community were doing the same thing to me. Other women in recovery, I couldn't believe it. But anyways, um, I'm still stuck at that 210, right? I'm over at my mother-in-law's house for three weeks. I'm pissed as hell that I have to be over there. And I'm just, I'm getting all my shit packed. I'm getting us all ready. And I find us a place to move into, right? I find us a place to move into and it's on and popping. So I get us all moved in. And like I said, I stepped on the scale last night and it said 199. And when I tell you guys, I know it's only one pound under 200, but I have not been able to get under 200 for years and I have been miserable. Okay. Um, oh yes. And she's not the only one that, ha that was being harassed. Just horrible. Yeah, Rita, it is horrible. And, um, a lot, and that Carol lady, he, uh, she passed away, you know, recently. And like I said, I don't wish death on anybody, but she was a 72 year old woman who had so much hate in her heart. She was miserable. So she's probably in a better place now, you know? But anyway, um, oh, I'm so grateful that she's not in my fucking hair no more. Um, I was so grateful to have lost the weight to get, to get down to this, you know? Um, Yes, so Carol Terwilliger. She's known she was known in the recovery community. She thought that she was like the FBI or some shit. And she, and what she would do was she did expose some really crooked people who were body brokers, but she also would accuse people who were not anything close to being body brokers of being body brokers like it was fact. And it wasn't. Okay, she's done it to me. She's done it to so many of us recovery people online who, who share our stories. But anyway, um, yeah, that that uh, Sonia lady, Tanya lady, uh, I had finally had enough with her. And I finally reported her to um, the Ohio Board of um, Counseling or whatever. Because she broke HIPAA by sharing Richie Weber's prescribed medications um, that he was on. Yeah, yeah. If I was a body broker, you guys, I would not, first of all, I would not be on here. Second of all, I would be flying from coast to coast eating green, green eggs and toast. Third of all, I would be making some badass fucking money. I'd be making like $10,000 per person that I would put into treatment. And thing about it is I don't work for a treatment center. I don't work for a rehab. I work in social media marketing and I also work with Dr. B and Dr. B is a provider. He's a doctor. Okay. So what I do for him is I answer the phones for him and I also work at his, um, mat treatment center where I help people who are, um, wanting to get sober. I help them, um, get signed up to get services and get help, you know, but they're already calling us and reaching out for help. So it's not like I'm like making them do anything, you know, um, super dangerous. Well, she's dead now. So <laughs> she's dead now. And I, and that's, like I said, that's sad. Nicole, don't laugh. It's sad, y'all. It is sad. But when you hear like the fucking horrible things that this lady did to me, you would totally understand why I'm not super fucking, uh, sad that she fucking croaked, you know? Like, she was really fucking mean to me, and she was miserable. But anyways, um, let's not talk about her, because this is about me and her, my weight loss and how hard I've worked. So, sorry, guys. What I've been working on now 
I'm just trying on lip glosses that I have in my purse. Is I've been working on what triggered me to, to, to get out of control like I did. And so I think it's really important whenever we get sober um, to reflect back on our um, addictions and figure out, like, what was it? What was, what pushed us? Hold on, I gotta grab a pen and I wanna talk to y'all about this. So when we get sober, I think it's really important that we um, we find out like why why were we doing what we were doing? What was happening in our in our minds? And so that's why I have been really trying to look back at my situation, at my addiction, and look at my cross addiction and figure out like what why why did why why did I let that what happened right? And so. I'm really glad that I that I was cross addicted, and that I didn't relapse on drugs. I went from 235 tish to 199, but today I weighed 201 when I um, after I ate. So that's like 34 pounds, 34 pounds. Um, and so I think it's really important to look back on that. So, okay, let's do that together. So when I look back on it, Nicole's. Weight loss. Okay. So when I look back on my life, right, um, I ha can tell you guys that I have struggled with my weight since I can remember. As long as I can remember. Okay. I actually started um, like yo-yo dieting and shit around like 14 or 15 years old. Okay. Um. So I'm going to write that down. Began uh, yo-yo dieting. So at a young age, I used to pay attention a lot to what my dad said. Okay. I love my dad. He's my best friend. I care about him so much. But he would always talk about his weight. And he was obsessed with his weight. Okay. Because he was a bodybuilder. Okay. He worked out. And wanted to maintain a, a good, solid physique, right? And so, <clears throat> he would always be talking about his weight, always working out at the gym. Well, guess what Nicole started to do? I started to always look at my weight and become obsessed with my weight. And um, it was something that was really, really driven home in our household. That, like, you know, being overweight is not, not attractive. Um, if you are overweight, you won't find a husband. Um, you don't want to be overweight and unhealthy, um, just overweight, bad, right? And so, um, I didn't want to be fat. I didn't want to be fat and, and be ugly, you know? Um, and, and that's what I thought. I thought if I was fat, that I would be ugly. And so, I started to starve myself, okay? So, 14 to 15 years old, I started to try to diet, and it, right? And then my 15 to 16, 15 to 17, actually, years old, I started to starve myself, okay? So I was in eighth grade, going into ninth grade, and we went to band camp. Thanks, Rita. And while I was at band camp, there was this really cute guy that I liked, and I really wanted him to notice me and like me, but I was, I was fat, right? I wasn't even 200 pounds, y'all. I was not even 200 pounds. Tish, Trish, these are very uh, monumental points in my life that were traumatizing to me. And so I, I don't remember a lot of stuff, but I remember points in my life that were traumatizing. <laughs> and so I really wanted this guy to like me. I remember thinking he was so cute, right? He was actually there for basketball camp, and I was there for band camp. True V Boost, B-O-O-S-T. Yes, you spelled it right. And so I started starving myself. And all I would eat was 
one Snickers bar and a Diet Coke every day, and that was it. And I was walking. It was the dead of the summer, and I had to walk around this campus. It was a college. It was huge, right? And so I was getting mad exercise. Baby, when I tell you guys, I dropped like 30 pounds. Like it was nothing so fast. And when I came back to school the next year in ninth grade, it was like, it was like this. I walked through the double doors and it was like, ah, it was like a light was lighting around me and all the boys started to notice me. All the guys in my high school started to fucking flirt with me and think I was hot. And I got a boyfriend. I started dating my first boyfriend who was John Ross, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it made me feel so good. It made me feel confident, right? Well, about eight months after date, started, I started dating John Ross, he cheated on me with another girl named Rhonda. And Rhonda was skinnier. She wasn't prettier than me, but she was skinnier than me. And I felt like shit. And ever since that day, I hadn't liked girls named Rhonda. Nothing personal, I just don't like the name. Well, it broke my heart, and I was very, very upset, right? But... I had just made the dance team and I was doing really good. I was in all these extracurricular activities. I, I was like, fuck this. I'm not going to let it get to me. I stayed a good, healthy, regular weight because I was involved in fast pitch softball, basketball, dance team, uh, all these different extracurricular activities. So I was always moving my bodies and always, always move my body and always working out. Well, by my 11th grade year, I had started using drugs. I had started drinking alcohol. I started smoking weed. Um, and I started smoking weed all day, every day. Before school, during school, and after school. Okay, we would skip classes, everything. And when I tell you guys, my 11th grade year, I gained so much weight, I couldn't fit into my cheer uniform anymore. I couldn't fucking zip my skirt. And I was mortified. And I was fucking so miserable and embarrassed. Okay? But honey, I couldn't stop smoking the ganja. I, I couldn't stop. And so I started, um, first I started out with um, prescription stimulants for my doctor for one month. Then I started buying ephedra off the, off the, um, across the counter because it was still in diet pills back then. I was getting like hydroxycut, herbal life, and all that shit. Then they took it off the shelves and I started doing methamphetamine and cocaine. And by my senior year, I was addicted to methamphetamine. I was a chronic user of methamphetamine. And I graduated high school and I started working my job at JCPenney in the makeup department and I was strung out on methamphetamine. You know, I would sell or I would trade products to my dope man for free meth. I, it was a hot mess and I was very tiny. I was skinny. Now for me, I'm five, three, five, well, I'm about five, four, five, four, five, three and a quarter, but I say five, four and 150 pounds for me is skinny, is thin, is like a size six. Okay. And for me, that's perfect. That's, that's very small for me. Now, I was getting below that and you, my eyes were starting to get sunk in and my cheekbones were really, you know, cut. And you could tell that I was doing something else rather than just eating healthy and losing weight. Um, but I was addicted to meth. And so from 17 till, you know, 32, I was um, on methamphetamine. Now, of course, I had, you know, bouts of sobriety when I would go to um, treatment or I would vow to never use again, right? But I also was started to use other substances like um, pain pills, benzos, shooting cocaine. Um, and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And it really got bad when I started to inject drugs. And that was probably around 2008 is when I started injecting. I graduated high school in 2000 and I started injecting drugs in 2008, and six months later, I had caught my first, and my only, thank God, felony possession charge, and I was placed on probation for three years. And I failed every single drug test, and they sent me to prison. In 2009, I went to prison, and I went from like 150 to 210 pounds, okay, when I came out of prison. 
for, so from 2009 to 2010, okay, which was, I was how old? 2008. So I was 18 in 2019, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. 25. I was 26 years old, okay? 26 years old. Um, one year in prison. And then I went up to 210 pounds when I came out of prison. And when I tell you guys, my mom came to pick me up. My mom and dad came to pick me up from prison to take me to the sober living halfway house that I was moving into. And they brought me clothes. And I remember crying my eyes out, you guys, because I could not fit my clothes. I could not fit my clothes. And so that's when I put my mind to it. I said, you know what? I can't live like this. I don't want to fucking be heavy. This is not what I want to do. I'm going to I'm gonna lose this weight. And so I started to exercise, walk everywhere I went, okay, walking and eating healthy. And I went from 210 uh, down to like 150, 160. And I was so happy. I was happier than I'd ever been. And I was in early sobriety. So I'm going to step in addiction every time I'm under stress. I lose so much weight. People think I'm still on drugs. Oh, Rita, it's okay, girl. Don't be, it's okay. You're, but we know you're not though, you know? Um... And so, I lost all that weight from eating 1,200 calories a day and walking, walking. Two hours a day, I would walk. I would make a, I would make a point to go to the Big Dam Bridge, and I would walk across this huge bridge, all through the woods, through this trail, back around, back over the bridge, and I would do it twice, and it would take me two hours. That's how long it was, okay? And I would be sweating. That's how I would be walking, like power walking, you know? And I lost that weight all in a healthy way. All in a healthy way. So, um, yeah, 2013, I get pregnant with my son, okay? And I went from about 160 to 200 pounds when I gave birth. And when I gave birth to my son, I was 200 pounds. And after I gave birth to him, I was like 187. Um, but <clears throat> when I gave birth to him, I was like going to stay sober. So I stayed sober for about 90 days. And then I relapsed. And when I relapsed, I just lost more weight. You know, so 2014, Nate is born. Born. I relapse. And get down to like 150 again. And then in 2015, I got sober. And like I said, it's totally normal to gain weight, right? To gain weight in sobriety. But this wasn't just like my, my weight gain in sobriety happened the first two or three years that I was sober, right? And it was normal. It wasn't a whole bunch. It was probably like 25 pounds. Well, maybe 20 pounds altogether over this a three or four year period of time, right? It was what came after that that was not healthy. And that's when I began to start binging like a mad woman. And that that is what has been really hard for me and really bad for me. Because I had I was in I was sober. But my life was so unmanageable and I was miserable. And I remember thinking, you know, like, I don't even want to have, I don't even want to get naked in front of my husband. It's not like I don't want to have sex. I don't want to get naked. You visit him. Right? And that feeling to not be able to get naked in front of your husband made me feel like shit, you know? Um, and I, then I started thinking, what if he's not attracted to me, you know? Trish says, it's okay, Trish. Trish, you know what can happen, honey? Uh, so like, that's what started to happen to me as I got older in my addiction. Um, it started to do the opposite of, you know, me losing weight. And what could happen is something could be wrong with your thyroid. Um, all your hormones are probably out of whack. Um, like methamphetamine really messes up your, your, um, body bad. Okay. Especially us women. Methamphetamine is the most addicting drug because it releases more dopamine than any other drug, a thousand percent, okay? Um, and it's more addicting than heroin, more addicting than fentanyl, more addicting than sex, more addicting than cocaine. It is so addicting because of the, how much fucking dopamine it releases into your brain. 
Um, but I'll tell you this, okay? The longer you do meth, the harder it is to, to, to get off of it and to stay away from it. Because you get so embedded in that, that society, that group, that way of living, right? Because it's a way of living. To be a tweaker is a way of living. You got to fucking get in, get, get it to live it, right? And so um, I hope that you'll get sober, okay? And I'm praying for you. And we're here for you if you need any support. I'm proud of you for coming and hanging out with us. Because y'all know that if you're still in active addiction, you're always welcome to hang out here with us. We, I don't give a fuck. You know, I'm not going to shame you. Fuck that. But um, I've come on here because I really wanted to talk to you guys about cross addiction. You know, you might not become cross addicted to uh, food like I did, but it could be spending money. You know, it could be online shopping. It could be gambling. It could be porn. It could be uh, sex. You could get cross-addicted to so many different things. And so um, if you're anything like me, if you become cross-addicted, you become miserable and you feel it. You know that something's not right, but you can't quite put your finger on it, right? And so um, try to start looking at, at your behaviors and what you're doing, right? And why are you doing it? Why am I continuing to use meth? Trish, ask yourself that. If, if it's not good for me and it's not fun anymore, then why do I keep doing it, right? Why do I keep doing this to myself? If I know that it's not good for me and I know that I don't need it and I know that I feel better when I'm not on it, why do I keep doing this, right? Something else is going on, right? Something else is going on that is that you are using why are you using what are you trying to escape okay what, what are you trying to escape what in your life um is making you unhappy that you feel the need to use drugs and out or use methamphetamine to escape your reality okay um and pinpoint that all right and then it's time to make a change and try time to change that Whatever it is, I know that you can do it, okay? Whatever it is, I know you can do it because I did it. Do you see this? Can you see how the sparkle in it? You can't really see it, can you? It's an opal that I've ordered, and I want to get it put into a ring, but I don't know anybody that could do it for me. It's so pretty. You guys can't really see how pretty it is because it's not showing on camera for some reason, but it's got like whoop, flashes of red and green and orange. But it's got like a gray base, you know. Um, oh, there you can see the flashes in it. See? Cool, huh? Anyway. Um, so I'm looking down at my little weight loss thing. Got sober and gained my sober weight, like I said, which is probably about 20 pounds or so. But then in 2020, when the panini hit, so in 2020, y'all, that's five years sober, okay? I was five years sober in 2020. Um, New visitor. That's a long time to be sober. Um, and I thought that I had had it all figured out, right? Me too, they're my favorite stone, Rita. I thought I had all figured out because at that time, I had just started doing the online recovery support group meetings on my YouTube channel, and we were blowing up, Okay. We were blowing up on the YouTube. We, we had an amazing group of people. There would be like 50 to 100 people coming um, to the meetings every night. And I was doing them every single night. I was live streaming doing these meetings. And so I was on top of the world. I felt like a million bucks. I felt like a million bucks, but I looked at myself and I hated what I saw. And I had to see myself every day because I was recording myself every day. And every time I had to record myself, I hated it. I hated seeing the person that was looking back at me. As I would be there trying to teach people about staying sober and recognizing their triggers and overcoming addiction and working through their struggles, I was picking myself apart, looking at my double chin, looking at how chubby my cheeks were getting, looking at how boxy I looked, right? I'm coming. And I was fucking miserable, miserable. And uh, that, it just got worse and worse and worse. Hey. It just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Hey, I need you to pick up your room so I can vacuum it, okay? So, 
Hairspray. Oh, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. That'll work. That'll work. Mm -hmm. They went shopping, y'all. Mm. What all did y'all get? Just like simple stuff. Nate wants me to dye his hair blue, you guys. We got a full x You got a what? Um, but that's how I figured out that my that it was my, that my shit was getting going downhill. Yeah, that's my little boy. He's um, eight years old. His name is Nate Nathaniel TV, uh, Alexander. Okay. We got a TV for my son because guess what he did when we moved in? He broke it. He broke his TV. <laughs> we made it through the whole move without breaking anything, and we we get home and Nate breaks his TV. Oh, Lord. He dropped something on the screen, um, and it, it just fucked it all up. But it's okay. Accidents happen, and we are working really hard, and I've been saving money, so we're going to get him. He's going to get his new TV today. What kind of TV are you getting, Nate? Is it a screen TV? Nathaniel. Nate. Please well, don't listen to me. Yeah, he dropped a, a truck on it, you guys. And um, he wasn't even going to tell us. He was going to let my husband think that the moving guys did it. And I knew the moving guys didn't do it because I checked it before uh, when they moved me in. Yeah. He's outside getting your TV. And so we went in there, and I said, they did not break that TV. I said, Nathaniel, did you break your TV? And that's when he got on this and said... Yes, I dropped my truck on it by accident, you know? And I was like, it's okay. I just want you to be honest with us, right? I'm not mad. I, it was an accident. I know you wouldn't do that on purpose, you know? Um, and that's the kind of parent I am. I don't want my son to be afraid to talk to me about something that he did, you know? I want him to come to me and tell me. And the reason why I'm so... Yes, he told me the truth. And so, and I didn't make a big deal out of it, and I didn't get mad at him because, like I said, when I was a little girl, I felt like I couldn't tell my parents anything because when I would, my dad would get so mad, you know? He would blow up. And that is not healthy. That don't help nobody. And it definitely doesn't help your kids to feel like they can come to you and tell you anything. And that's the kind of relationship that I'm trying to create with my son is that he can come to me and his daddy and talk to us about anything. We're not going to be mad. We might be disappointed, but we're not going to get mad and nothing could ever make us not love him. So what do y'all think about that? Is that good parenting or what? <laughs> what are you doing, buddy? Okay, don't make a mess because I just vacuumed, son. Okay? I'm not. Now you're getting me up. Now I'm getting a little upset with you. I'm not. Okay, put it up, please. I see you. Put it up. Can you show box He's Boxman. Oh. <laughs> so, you okay, Jenna? Um, yeah, so I've. I just feel like really passionate and really serious about that, you know? Now, I will tell you this. I need to work on disciplining him in a healthy way, you know, because I don't know how to. And I, get, and I don't want to get mad, right? So it's a little, it's hard being a mom. It's definitely not easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thanks, CJ. I appreciate the compliment. We, we really do. It means a lot to us. Uh, me and my husband have worked really, really hard to get to where we're at today, and it, it's been no easy feat, right? We both were very, we've both been drug addicts since we were uh, teenagers, and so getting and staying sober has been challenging for the both of us because we both struggled with addiction, and so um, 
getting sober with your significant other is hard. Um, I don't know if you guys have any experience with that, but it's not easy. It is not easy at all. Ah, Mountain Dews flying everywhere. Nate in his room. What? It says Nate in his room. No, he's right there. Nate, come on. Nate, you need to go tie? Come, come, we'll help Daddy. Put your TV up. I never in a million years thought anybody would be giving up me a compliment on how my family. So thank you. I appreciate that. And this was that last box that was in the car. Okay. Right where you want to put it? Uh, right there. Hold on, Squirt. I'll take you down there. Yeah, I guess we already had some Swiffer wet jet things. Yeah. How far do you need to go outside to Yeah. But are any of you guys struggling with your weight? In the box. If you are, tell me about it. Hey, that's right, Trish. You're welcome, girl. That's exactly why I make my videos. So I'm not trying to be like some fucking guru. I'm not trying to be a know-it-all or anything like that. I'm just trying to show people that if I can do it, they can do it. You know what I mean? My birth CD. You know, if I can do it, they can do it. Hey, Maria, what's up, girl? Right, Nate? Huh? If I can do it, they can do it, can't they? And my son knows that about my addiction because I've talked to him about it. And he knows that I'm in recovery. And he knows that he got taken away from me when he was little, but I got him back and I fought tooth and nail to get him back because he was so important to me. And I made some mistakes when he was in my belly, but I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. And I will forever, ever, 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 ever be working on forgiving myself for that, you know? But my little boy helps me stay sober. He helps me stay accountable. Shoot, he fucking reminds me to go live sometimes. <laughs> For some support, I really need. Okay, girl, I'll reach up. I have to go through my messages, okay? Because uh, a lot of y'all's messages go to spam. So what I do in the evening is I go through all my messages. So I'll find it. Um, okay, if you want to talk about it, you can put it in the comments. Nobody's going to judge you here. Um... Yeah, abusive relationships, I've been there. I totally understand, and I'm glad that you got out of that situation. Good job. Okay, that's the best thing you can do is just get out of that situation. I will tell you this. When I got out of the abusive relationship that I was in for six years, I cried every single night for a year. Okay? Even though this dude beat my ass, I cried because I fucking was broken, and I thought that I deserved it. I thought that I couldn't do any better than what I was doing and that I was always going to, you know, be nothing. Because he had, he had brainwashed me into believing that. So, and look at me now. I got a man that don't lay a hand on me. I got a beautiful son. I got a nice life. I get to help people all day. And so, it is possible to turn it around. You know? Yeah, he used to bounce my fucking head off the damn concrete. One time, he beat my ass so hard, or beat me so bad, that um, I had a concussion that was so severe that when I would stand up, I would fall down like timber, like a tree. Okay? Um, and <clears throat> I left the house because I had to go to work at McDonald's at night from 11 p.m. to 7 in the morning. And I went to my parents' house. Uh, and they, I, they answered the door and my mom said, I looked like a fucking alien because my head was swollen so bad. I looked like a, a fucking alien. And, um, that motherfucker did not give a damn. He could have killed me. He has me believing. Oh. Girl, I've hit that, I hit my husband, I hit this dude back too, not my husband. I hit that dude back too, because he fucking pushed me to my limits, you know? And then when I would hit him, he would try to act like I was fucking the bad person. I was the psycho, you know? Um, he would make me believe that I, uh, 
put my keys somewhere else because I would be looking for my car keys. He's gaslighting you. He's gaslighting you, okay? He's gaslighting you. So don't fuck... I'm telling you, man, these motherfuckers nowadays are even more crazier, okay? Because of all the shit that's going on in the world. And you... I, I see it all the time. I watch true crime where these boyfriends, they kill their uh, girlfriends or wives or whatever. Oh, it's horrible. So good for you. And you know what? The, the guy who I finally got away from, his ass is dead. His ass is dead. He got killed in a like a drunk driving accident. Um, and my dad, I remember calling my dad and telling him that he died. And my dad was like, I've been waiting for it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know but it's crazy you know like he fucking tortured me for six years of my life you know he made me feel like so horrible like the lowest form of low um and all I did was help him I bought him a new car I helped him pay off his fines and fees because he was on probation Okay, like, I, I helped him, dude. I, I rescued that dude from the gutter. From the gutter, okay? He had nothing. All right, when I met him, he was homeless, okay? He was homeless. And I helped him. I wasted six years of my life with that fool. But you know what I believe? I believe that God put me in all these positions, right? All these different things that I wasted my life doing so I would have this personal lived experience and I could help other people. You know what I'm saying? So I could help other people. So I know it might feel like, you know, a hard... I know you might be sad right now because y'all were together for a long time. But I'm telling you, girl, the pain will fade. It will fade and you will be so grateful that you got the fuck up out of Dodge. You know? You will be so grateful. Um, Cause it, it's gonna be the best decision you ever made. I'm telling you, I'm telling you man, that's what happened for me. It was the best decision I ever made and it opened me up to be able to meet my husband. Hey Sky, you know who I'm with now. So we're all gonna pray for you Maria. Everybody please pray for Maria. She just got out of a really abusive relationship, and I know a lot of you guys have been there too, so we need to pray for her, for God to give her some strength and help her to continue staying away from that piece of shit motherfucker. Okay? Okay. This is a stovetop grill, so that will come in handy one day. Ooh, I want to put this light. Where's that blue light? Hold on, guys. I want to put this light over here. We're gonna have to get some leashes. Why? This is like wilding out. Well, there's just so many cars uh -huh. that are flying through there that it's just dangerous. Okay. Oh, I was thinking I could put this damn light bulb in there, but I can't get it to go in. Maybe you can. It can't be. It's not a regular size light bulb. I know. Does this fit? I don't. I, I. I thought it would. I think it might. Thank you, Rita. Rita, how long were you in a, an abusive relationship for? Thank you. Hey, Brooke. What's up, girl? What's up? I appreciate that uh, for real, man. I've been working my ass off. I've been working hard. Um, I'm kind of thinking something else is broken in there. Yeah? Okay. Well, I thought that light was so pretty and it would look good because... Um, it used to work. I just... I, it, this might just not be the size that it Cause needs. Because our color... Um, our color palette is going to be, you know, are the navy blues and the blues and stuff. So... Yeah, I think there was like a, a nothing. Thank you, Brooke. I really appreciate it, girl. I've been working really hard. Like I said, I'm trying not to yeah. um, eat too much and change the way I, um, my relationship with food. And so it's been really hard for me. Let me wash my hands. That's me right there. 
That's my family. Me, my mama, my dad, my nephew Nick, and my sister. <laughs> you want to see it? Why is it in? Because we went to Branson to a magic show. So I'm going to take that out of there. I'm going to put their cute faces on here. Is there a me in there? Yeah, it's the hardest addiction because it's a... It's legal and food is everywhere. You have to eat. That's what I was just telling everybody that my life was unmanageable and I was sober. And I was just like, what the fuck, man? This sucks. But I was just showing everybody that um, what I do now is I have learned to reflect and look back at where, what, what, what happened, okay? So I've always had an unhealthy relationship with food. Okay, ever since I was a little girl, um, because my uh, father had an unhealthy relationship with food, and he was very vocal about his unhealthy relationship with food and talked about his weight and all that kind of stuff all the time. And so, growing up in a household where your dad's always talking about being fat or not liking his weight and working out like a madman, right? Um, then you're going to be obsessed with it too. And so that's what happened. You know, thank you. Uh, we just moved into this apartment, so I'm un unpacking. This is me and my husband's first apartment that we're not living and renting from his mom. And so we're really, really excited about it. Because we were living in my mother-in-law's house where we rented from her. And so now we're on our own. Yeah, um, and we're on the third floor, <laughs> which is hardcore, but we are uh, making it. So that's why I'm unpacking while I talk to y'all. Oh, good. He, he, he changed then, huh, Rita? Good. Well, you know, a lot of times drugs will be a factor in why pe that people are, you know, doing stuff like that. But, um... Like, why do we have shot glasses? <laughs> like, sometimes I look at stuff that I find, and I'm like, where did this come from? <laughs> it must have come from my mother-in-law. Because <laughs> when we, we moved in, my mother-in-law had all her stuff there, you know? Really, Allie? Do y'all notice it? Nay. <laughs> I remember my son having hit those handcuffs. Uh, keep that. But, you guys, if I can get sober and lose weight, so can you. So can you. Hey, Dad. What's wrong, baby? Okay. Is Daddy hooking up your TV? Yeah, like when me and my husband were together, uh, we would fight, you know. And a lot of times I would pr I would be, get physical with my husband, um, you know, because of my past history being abused. It something I would do, and I'm not proud of that, you know. Um, I hate that I did that to my husband, you know. Um, but he's always been a good man, and he really didn't ever put his hands on me, you know. grateful for that so anyways if you um if you just came in and y'all want to see like how i've been like you know working on my weight and what i've been doing um it's i put a whole this this whole video i've been talking about it oh i'm sorry this whole video and i actually was able to start now what i'm doing is i'm reflecting on why do i binge eat what 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 is it that happens that makes me binge, right? What is going on? So a lot of the times the reason why I binge, like I was telling everybody before, is stress, okay? Stress. And so, um, like I started looking at what am I stressing about? What is going on in my life that I'm stressed out about, you know? And so I'm trying to minimize stress, um, minimize, like, trigger foods that I will just, like, eat mindlessly, right? So one of the things that my husband, uh, he doesn't mean to, but he loves to get like unhealthy snacks, like 
uh, oatmeal cream pies and no, you know, all the zuzus and wham whams. Okay. And for me, I will aimlessly like eat those. And so I have to be very mindful and not just aimlessly eat, um, those little snacks and stuff that he'll get. Um, I also make sure that I'm eating three meals a day now. Um, I'm just really mindful of how much food I put in my mouth now. I was just like not even counting calories. And you know, the older you get, you guys, it just is what it is. But like you can't just, we can't eat like we used to, okay? I used to put some fucking food away, dude. And I was fine. But now that I'm older, my body doesn't burn it off like it used to, you know? And so, ah! <laughs> I can't just eat like that anymore. It sucks because I love to eat. I know, right? It is very hard. Our men just don't get it. Because they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. My husband, he just loses weight. He's just thin naturally. Naturally thin. He's never had... The only time my husband was heavy was when he was on methadone. And it was because... And he wasn't really, like, heavy as in fat. He was just chunkier than he is now. Uh, when he was on methadone, he would... Um, he would wake up in the middle of the night and eat sweets. And so... That's why he was heavy on methadone. But other than that, he's always been skinny. A little turd on her. Y'all should see this whole place. I'll show y'all. For those of you guys who haven't gotten to see my apartment. I'm going to show you guys how This is badass. I mean, it's badass to me. You know what I mean? This is our living room. Our couch is coming in the mail because I just, I had to order it. And this is our office kind of space. Laundry room. Nate's room. Or bathroom. <laughs> Nate's room. Okay. Kitchen. Dining room. Our bedroom and like I said I'm still really straightening everything out and getting it all situated so it's a little cluttered right now but I'm getting it all together our bathroom okay and our closet where I really need to put all my shoes away the right way because I just threw them in there haphazardly because I was um, you know uh, put them away. So, do do do. I got these new boots. Let me show them to y'all. I haven't worn them yet. They're super cute. They're Doc Martens. Oh, see, um, I buy everything off Poshmark. That's super expensive. So that way, I don't have to pay full price for it. You know, I'm selling these boots. If y'all know anybody that wants them. Okay, they're nice boots. I'm just not a uh, cowboy boot person. So, thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. It really is it a big apartment? I don't see. I don't know what normal apartments are, you know, but uh, it's so much smaller than the home that we lived in because our house was huge, huge. <laughs> <laughs> like way too big and so um it's a big change going from such a big house you know but i love it i love it oh uh, the cowboy boots are and i'm selling them for like 40 bucks y'all i paid like a hundred and something for them and that i've only worn them like twice they're size nine um they're super cute i just don't wear them you know what i mean also, these Converse, if anybody knows somebody that wears a size um, 9, women's 9, because those are high top Converse, and I just don't wear those either. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate that. Really, I do. I appreciate your compliment. My husband took up all the damn fucking closet, dude. Y'all should see this shit. He took up the whole damn closet. 
Okay, Allie. Um, like, how am I supposed to live like this? You took up the whole damn closet, motherfucker. Ugh. I got all my purses in here. So y'all know how I like to collect purses. Okay. Oh, these are my brand new fucking new balances. And the Converse. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, this Converse, I'll sell them to you for like 15 bucks. They're brand new. <laughs> like, look at... They're cute. I just don't wear them. I need to wash these new balances. They're my pink new balances. Okay. And then I got my Chacos, which I love these. These, I'll wear these for the rest of my life. They're so comfortable and they're so easy to wear when, during the summertime. And then my, these babies are my Birkenstocks. So I have been wanting Birkenstocks for years, y'all. Years and years and years. And um, I, I just couldn't afford them, right? Couldn't afford them. <sighs> because I was, you know, first getting sober and just didn't have the money. So you know what I did? I went on to Poshmark, and instead of paying $110, I paid $40 for brand new Birkenstocks. So, that's the way to go. I love this purse. So, I got this purse from Poshmark. It's leather. $35. Bucks. Love it. Love it. I'll show you another one I got from Converse. Like, I'm a Converse connoisseur, okay? Like, I think they're amazing. I have a purse coming in that I have to pick up from the uh, mail, mail post office uh, tomorrow or Monday. And it is a, um, it's a Chloe bag. And it was expensive, but I think I'm going to get rid of this Dooney. Burke, Dooney, Dooney and Burke purse. I paid so much money for this fucking purse, dude. <sighs> so annoying. It's a nice fucking purse, y'all. I just don't wear it. I just don't wear it. Oh, I hate when I do shit like that, you know? Let's see what else I got going on here. And like I said, I'm just chit-chatting with y'all because I'm, like I said... I am trying to organize and stuff. Oh, I got this one from Poshmark 2. Again, all leather. Super fucking cool. You know? Oh, that Dooney? Yeah, it's a nice fucking bag, dude. It was like... You can look it up on um, line. I think it was like $400. Um, it was expensive. Okay, where's the other purses I want to get rid of? Okay, so I want to sell, sell that Dooney. I want to sell this B. Mikowski. So it's leather also. It's like a hobo. And then I want to also sell... Yeah. This pink one. It's also leather. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty. Too. They're, it's really pretty. and There's nothing wrong with it. Okay. This is my Alexander Wang bag. I paid a pretty penny for that fucking bag. But I got it from Poshmark for, you know, cheaper than I would have paid outright. So, I'm proud of myself for at least getting the discounts, you know. And look, what other purses do I want to get rid of? Sorry, I'm trying to find all the purses I'm going to get rid of so I can sell them to people, you know? This one right here I got from Poshmark. Super cute. Leather. Hobo. Braided handles. Super cool fucking um, metal. Okay. Oh yeah, and then this purse. This is a coach purse. Brand new. Only been used like three times. Has a cross body, body bag. Has this. Black leather. Sell that one. Oh, let's see what else. This is my coach. I love my coach because it's just practical and easy to use. Um, what else? Look at 
Look how old. Do you see how old this is? This is the Dooney and Burke old school. Uh, old. <sighs> oh, I'll keep that. That's simple and gray. I don't have very many gray bags, you know? And I'll show you one of my favorite bags, y'all. And it's old as fuck, but it's one of my favorite purses. It's a fossil. And I love how it has all the different color leathers. And it was one of my first, like, nice bags. And I'll probably never get rid of it because I just love it that much. Okay. Last purse. Yeah, here's the one I want to get rid of. And then this messenger bag, which is super cute, all leather, right? I just don't wear it. So, okay. Let me see. One. Yeah, these are all leather bags. Super fucking nice, too. I need to, like, take pictures of them and shit. You know what I mean? And list them on somewhere. Oh. Okay. I'm getting tired now, y'all. <laughs> okay. I guess what I'll probably do is, like, post them here on Facebook and let people know that they're for sale and see who wants them here first. And then if nobody wants them from my Facebook, then I'll put them on Poshmark. But I'll give my Facebook people the option to buy first. Do you know what I'm saying? So. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with me and chit-chatting. Um, I sure did. I love sharing with you guys about, you know, my life and my accomplishments. The things that I'm working towards, which is, you know, my weight now. Oh, oh, oh. So, I love you guys. Be good. If y'all want any of my purses, I'm not going to rob you blind for how much they cost. Yes, there are a lot of them are very expensive, okay? But I'm not going to rip anybody off. I'm not like that. Hold on. Okay, there's my fucking YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, so like that one purse that was like $400, I'll probably sell it for like $150. Okay. Um, this pink purse, $25. Bucks, all leather. This cream colored purse, $15. Bucks, all leather. $150. And probably 125. Do you know what I'm saying? And so that's cheap as fuck for those bags. So I love.